are going to talk about the endocrine system today. Now I know we've already talked a little bit about it with the general adaptation syndrome. We talked about the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, the adrenal glands, and we won't be going over that again in this lecture. Uh, but we are going to talk about hormones in other parts of the body. Some of the hormones, again, we will not cover in this lecture, but that's because we're going to cover them in the cardiovascular system, the renal system, and so on. So some of these things will be covered today, and some of them will be covered in other lectures. So we've already talked about the definition of a hormone, and basically this is a chemical that's being secreted from a gland. It gets into the bloodstream and has to travel from point A to point B. Now hormones are very similar in function to what neurotransmitters are doing. The difference is that hormones are coming from a gland, going into the bloodstream. Neurotransmitters just come from a neuron. Hormones also stimulate other organs and neurotransmitters only stimulate other neurons. But they are both causing signals to happen from one place to another in the body. Hormones usually also are secreted in much higher concentrations than neurotransmitters. So you can get a bigger response. And neurotransmitters usually are able to be secreted very quickly. So the response is much faster, whereas hormones, they take a little time to build up. The response is a wee bit slower, but it lasts for a much longer period of time. So we're going to talk about three basic types of hormones. One we've already kind of mentioned, which would be the protein hormones, also known as peptide hormones. And then we <coughs> discussed a little bit about steroid hormones. These are the ones that are made out of cholesterol, they're fat soluble. And then there's another group of hormones which come from the amino acid tyrosine. And we've actually discussed some of these, which would be epinephrine and norepinephrine. They're actually derived from this amino acid. So we'll go into those a little bit more as we go along. So again, coming from the nervous system, you have a neurotransmitter that's being released, and this information, again, is traveling from point A to point B, but nothing gets put into the bloodstream. Whereas with hormones and the endocrine system, you have some hormone, whoops, sorry about that, some hormone that's released into the bloodstream and then has to bind to a receptor on the target cell or if it's a steroid hormone, a receptor inside the target cell, but it still has to respond to a receptor for the cell to make any changes. So neurons are releasing neurotransmitter. We also have what are called neurosecretory cells. Now, this is kind of interesting, and we'll talk about the exception to the rule here. Typically, we say a neuron releases a neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter typically is stimulating another neuron, or in the case of the sympathetic nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system, the neurotransmitter can directly stimulate an organ. But there are these unusual neurons that do secrete hormones. So make your life a little bit more difficult. There's a few neurons that secrete these chemicals that will eventually go into the bloodstream and act like hormones. And we call these neurosecretory cells. And we'll talk about where they come from. If it's just a simple old endocrine cell, a hormone cell coming from a gland, it's secreting from that cell directly into the bloodstream. Notice, though, calcium is needed for each one of these to occur. Whether it's a neurotransmitter or hormone release, you've got to have calcium present. It's a very important mineral in the body. So I want to talk about four different types of hormonal secretion. We have autocrine, paracrine, endocrine, and exocrine secretions. Okay, so I want you to be able to understand all of these different secretions. So, autocrine. If I have a cell, and let's 
say this is the nucleus of my cell, and my cell releases some type of hormone which comes back and affects the cell directly, this is autocrine secretion. If I have a cell that releases a hormone and it affects cells that are like right next door or very close by, this is called paracrine secretion. So autocrine, I secrete a chemical that comes back and affects me, my own cell. Or I secrete a chemical that affects my neighbor, this is paracrine. Or I secrete a chemical that travels to a completely different neighborhood and affects a different cell, this is endocrine. And usually when we think about hormones, we're talking about endocrine. Exocrine is when I'm going to secrete something onto the body surface or into like my intestines. So when you sweat and that sweat gets onto your skin, that's exocrine. Or when the pancreas releases enzymes into the small intestine, that's exocrine, okay? We're not gonna be going into that at all today. Okay, so let's go back over just a little bit about lipid soluble hormones. And we've already talked about the fact that these are steroid hormones. Uh, but there's one other type of hormone that's also lipid soluble. Uh, this would be the thyroid hormones. And the thyroid hormones also, like epinephrine and norepinephrine, they come from tyrosine. They come from that amino acid and they are able to dissolve through the cell membrane. So if I have a cell, and this is the nucleus of my cell with the DNA inside that nucleus, I can have a couple different types of hormones like we talked about. One type of hormone is able to bond to receptors on the outside of the cell, and you remember that stimulates adenylate cyclase, which then makes cyclic AMP, and that cyclic AMP then communicates with the DNA, okay? And these are usually your peptide or your protein hormones. Your lipid soluble hormones, on the other hand, their receptors are hanging around on the inside of the cell. And they are going to come directly through the cell membrane and bind to the receptor and that receptor takes them into the nucleus of the cell to stimulate the DNA so that, just like cyclic AMP, protein synthesis occurs. These are going to be your lipid hormones. So these are your steroid hormones. These are your thyroid hormones. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, those are all going to go inside the cell and all bind to receptors floating around in the cell, which also means can you downregulate against these lipid soluble hormones? Mm -hmm. Nope. 
So the lipid insoluble would be like insulin. That's a really good example. ACTH that we talked about is not lipid soluble. Those are all protein hormones. So in this picture, you can see this is the receptor that the hormone is going to bind to. If it's lipid soluble, it can move right through the cell membrane and then right into the DNA to start transcription translation. Sometimes there's a receptor in the cytoplasm, sometimes there's a receptor directly in the nucleus, depending on which hormone we're talking about. But the whole idea here is that these hormones get into the cell and they are what activates protein synthesis inside your cell. They cause the DNA to create certain proteins and those proteins then create reactions in your cell. The hormone doesn't directly stimulate reactions. It directly stimulates the DNA so that protein synthesis can occur. If it's lipid insoluble, the hormone is going to bind to a receptor on the outside surface of the cell. And you know adenylate cyclase is activated and you get that second messenger system going on. And then that will create the cellular effect, protein synthesis, and so on. Now, one of the things that you should know about protein hormones especially is that many of them are floating around in our bloodstream all the time. However, they're floating around in the bloodstream in a form that is not active. That means although the hormone is there, it can't do anything. So why the heck would we have hormones floating around in our bloodstream that can't do anything for us? Well, it's just in case. Just so that we can be ready in case we need them. They're right there. We don't have to wait for them to be made and secreted. So these hormones can be floating around in what we call a pre-hormone type of shape. And it only takes a little bit of a change in the shape of the hormone to, bam, get it activated. So, for instance, you have insulin that's floating around in your bloodstream right now and it's not doing anything. It's just waiting for you to eat something. And it is in what we would call a pre-hormone shape. Now, some of these hormones are called pre-hormones. Some are called pre-pro-hormones. And if they're called pre-pro, that tells you two different things have to happen to the hormone to get it activated. You have to activate it in one shape and then activate it into a second shape, and now all of a sudden the hormone is ready to go. And I'll give you some examples of activation of these hormones as we go along. This is just showing you the amino acid tyrosine and how tyrosine can be converted into epinephrine or norepinephrine, or tyrosine can be converted into thyroxine, which is one of the thyroid hormones. Now there's a term right here I want you to know. This is a term called catecholamines. Catecholamines are a group of three hormones. One is epinephrine, the second is norepinephrine, and then the third is dopamine. These are our catecholamine hormones. Now the reason I want you to know these is because you're going to, in your time in the medical field, most likely be working with what we call catecholaminergic medicines. That means they're medicines that stimulate catecholamine release in a person's body. And these medicines are super duper important for a number of different things. So you have to be aware of what a catecholamine is. So you're increasing their epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine levels for a number of different reasons. Any questions so far? All right. So let's talk about the brain. 
Now we've talked a little bit so far about the hypothalamus, but we're going to talk a whole lot more as we go along about this portion of the brain because it's a major, major controller of the body. Now, if you remember, okay, let's kind of get ourselves oriented here. Here's the frontal lobe, here's the cerebellum, occipital lobe, and then this right here is the corpus callosum, and right here is the thalamus, and then right underneath the thalamus is the hypothalamus. And then there's a little bean-like structure right here underneath the hypothalamus, and this is the pituitary gland. So looking a little closer, here's our hypothalamus, and then underneath the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. And you remember we have an anterior, <coughs> excuse me, and a posterior pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary gland and the posterior pituitary gland are a little bit different as far as secretion of hormones are concerned. So we need to talk about those for just a few minutes and what they do. hypothalamus first and then we'll go into the anterior and posterior pituitary. So the hypothalamus is officially still a part of the brain whereas the anterior and posterior pituitary sit underneath the brain. It's connected to but it's not officially part of the brain. Now what that really means for you is that since the hypothalamus is part of the brain it's all about neurons. Okay? There's a ton of neurons in the hypothalamus. And when we look at these neurons, they're kind of interesting because some of these neurons in the hypothalamus, they all kind of group together with all their cell bodies sort of sitting next to each other in these groups. And you have multiple groups of neurons in the hypothalamus with their cell bodies sitting next to each other like this. And this happens in the central and peripheral nervous system and if you have neurons where they're all grouped together like this in the central nervous system these are referred to as nuclei if you have groups of neurons that are all sitting next to each other and grouped together in the peripheral nervous system these are called ganglion so you might have heard of a patient who has like a ganglion cyst Okay, that would be somebody who, they have all these neurons grouped together and for whatever reason, their body just decided to make a whole bunch of connective tissue to grow around it and they made like this connective tissue bubble around their neurons. And a lot of times the ganglion cysts will be right at the surface of the skin. So you might have, it's very common to have them like in the wrist, okay, in the back of the wrist and you'll see like this big bubble in somebody's skin or they can get them along the spinal cord. You can get a lot of ganglion cysts there. Um, there's two ways to get rid of ganglion cysts. One is you can go and have them surgically popped, uh, but that could potentially be dangerous because you're taking a scalpel to a region that has a whole bunch of neurons in it. The other way is um, you pop it yourself. So you get a ganglion cyst and the doctor will probably say, well, you know, 
And I've heard doctors say, well, you know, if you just like put your hand, because let's say you have one here, just put your hand down and have somebody drop a bunch of books on it. It'll pop. Or just take your hand and whack it against something. It'll pop. Whack it appropriately, because it might pop and break, but <laughs> it, it'll pop usually. Anyway, so this group of neurons, and we have multiple groups of neurons throughout the hypothalamus. These are referred to as nuclei, and each group has its own name. You have things like the paraventricular nuclei, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, and not that you need to memorize those, but each one of those nuclei have a different job. So some of them control body temperature. Some of them regulate your circadian rhythms or your sleep-wake cycles. Some of them help to secrete various different hormones, okay? And some of these have axons that are short. Some of these neurons that group as nuclei actually have axons that are very long and go all the way down into the posterior pituitary. between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary are some blood vessels. And I'm just going to draw one, but imagine there's a whole bunch of them. Anybody remember what those blood vessels are called? They're the pituitary portal system. No big deal. I'm not going to test you on that. But. <laughs> Okay, so what we see happening is that these neurons with the short axons, they will secrete hormones that actually get into this portal system, into this bloodstream, and enter into the anterior pituitary. So for instance, you'll probably recognize this. This group of neurons, let's say, they secrete a hormone called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone, which then gets into the bloodstream and goes to the anterior pituitary and stimulates some of the cells in the anterior pituitary to secrete what hormone? Which hormone? ACTH. ACTH. <coughs> Which then, of course, we know gets into the bloodstream and goes where? Adrenal cortex. Exactly. And then we get cortisol secretion. So these hormones with the shorter axons are secreting into the anterior pituitary, getting the anterior pituitary to respond, and then this hormone goes into the bloodstream and you get a response someplace else. Now there's multiple groups of these short axons. Each one of these short axons releases some type of hormone that has releasing hormone as its name. So if it's a short axon going to the anterior pituitary, it's something releasing hormone. So corticotropin releasing hormone, or here's one, growth hormone releasing hormone. So for instance, you'll have growth hormone releasing hormone get into this bloodstream and can you imagine which hormone it causes the anterior pituitary to make? Which one? If this is growth hormone releasing hormone, which hormone do you think comes from the anterior pituitary? Growth hormone. Exactly. So there are several different releasing hormones that we'll talk about as we go along that causes the anterior pituitary to be stimulated and then the anterior pituitary secretes some kind of hormone. So from the anterior pituitary, we'll have things like ACTH, growth hormone. We're going to talk about this a little bit later when we get into the reproductive system, but you're going to have luteinizing hormone. You're also
also going to have follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, you're going to have thyroid stimulating hormone. Somatostatin comes from the hypothalamus. Oh yes, that's what I thought it was. Prolactin. And each of these has a releasing hormone. Okay? So, thyroid stimulating hormone, we have thyroid releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus to cause thyroid stimulating hormone to be released from the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary releases oxytocin, and we'll talk about this more, but just for now we'll say this is the cuddle hormone. I love, I love this research. I love oxytocin research because when they first started doing research on oxytocin, they didn't know what the heck it did. Except they know that oxytocin affects the female breast and affects breast milk production. But they wanted to know what oxytocin does in men. And so they started studying oxytocin in different animals. And these researchers who did the first oxytocin research in male animals, they concluded that oxytocin makes males actually, after they have sex, want to cuddle. I'm kind of thinking it doesn't equate to the human male. I'm thinking maybe it causes, like, instead of cuddling, the drive for a sandwich or something. <laughs> yeah, it just seems more reasonable, okay? Um, but we do know one interesting thing about oxytocin. Once someone has sex, now, we, they've never done studies in gay relationships, okay? So we're talking about male-female sexual intercourse. So once a male and female have sexual intercourse, their levels of oxytocin actually go up and they go up really high and they actually rewire the person's brain. So that you see thought processes in the individual who has had sexual intercourse change. Now if you've ever noticed your friends, they have sex with somebody and all of a sudden they're in love with that person and you're thinking, what kind of an idiot are you? You shouldn't have anything to do with that person, but they just had sex with them, so they're in love with them, right? Okay, you've seen it, okay? Uh, and this is because oxytocin actually does rewire the brain for both male and female. And so their thought processes towards the other person are probably much more generous than they would have been if they hadn't had sex. Which is probably an interesting reason why you might not want to have sex with somebody before you marry them to make sure that you're actually thinking straight about marriage and getting married to somebody for the next 50 some years and you don't want to hate them. Okay? <laughs> Which, well, yeah. yeah, anyway. Um, I, hey, just something to think about. I'm just saying, I didn't come up with it. This is oxytocin, okay? Another hormone that's released from the posterior pituitary is ADH which stands for anti-diuretic hormone. And we're really going to talk about this more when we get into the renal system. So these are the various different hormones that are coming from the hypothalamus, coming from the anterior pituitary, so you can see the setup. But notice, even though these two, oxytocin and ADH, are being released from the anterior pituitary, they were actually made in the cell body in the hypothalamus. And then they came all the way down through this neuron and are released into the bloodstream via the posterior pituitary. Mm -hmm. Any questions at this point? Mm -hmm. I keep struggling with that. All right, so we are going to talk about the thyroid now.
and we're going to in particular talk about the different hormones that interact with the thyroid and what those hormones do as far as interacting with the body. So we have thyrotropin releasing hormone and again anytime you see releasing hormone you know this is coming from the hypothalamus from these short axons going down into the anterior pituitary and causing the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. So TRH is coming from the hypothalamus. Stimulating the anterior pituitary gland to release TSH. TSH then causes T3 and T4 release from the thyroid. Now T3 stands for triiodothyronine. And we say three because it has three iodine molecules in it. Thyroxine is T4, which tells us we have four iodine molecules in this hormone. And both of these hormones control the body metabolism. And I think we talked about this like the first week of class. What kind of definition did we give for metabolism? Did we talk about this? Okay, it's all those different chemical reactions going on in the body. And T3 and T4 are basically controlling the speed of these metabolic reactions. Okay, so that if you don't have enough T3 and T4 secretion, then your metabolism is going to be down. If you have too much T3 and T4 secretion, your metabolism is going to be too high. What do we call it if your metabolism is too high because of too much T3 and T4? Hyperthyroid, or also known as Graves' disease. And if the metabolism is too low? Hypothyroid. Okay? So this is just a picture showing you the thyroid. Here's the thyroid cartilage or the Adam's apple, and then sitting right below that is your thyroid gland. Okay, there's a little uh, bridge across or isthmus across to um, connect the two parts of the thyroid. So if we have hypothyroidism in the mom, so mom is pregnant and she has hypothyroidism. This can develop what is called cretinism in the child. And cretinism usually means that the child, when they start to grow and develop, they're not going to develop appropriately in the fetal stage of development as well as later in life. So mom's thyroid hormones are helping this fetus to develop, which also means mom's thyroid hormones are helping the fetal thyroid to develop as well. Cretinism with the fetus, they're going to have stunted growth. They're also typically going to have mental retardation. Uh, and then they have thyroid issues themselves and a whole number of other problems. So it's very important to make sure that mom has the correct levels of thyroid hormone when she's pregnant so that the child also has the correct levels as well. Now, hypothyroidism can be caused by a number of different problems. One of the problems is a lack of iodine in the diet. And this has become a bigger issue nowadays than maybe, let's say, 10 years ago. And that's because people are eating things like sea salt and Himalayan rock salt. Now, it's very interesting because one of the things that happens is when thyroid hormones are produced, this TRH and TSH, what they're doing is they're causing iodine metabolism to increase in the thyroid and uh, we start to produce the correct hormones. However, if a person is lacking in iodine in their diet, TSH tries to get the thyroid gland to make 
more hormone and more hormone, and it can't because there's just not enough iodine. So what happens is it actually starts to produce this gel-like substance in the thyroid, and the cells start to swell from this gel-like substance, and you get this thing that you can see in this picture here, we call it a goiter. And this is swelling of the thyroid. And people who even have a slight goiter, one of the things they'll tell you is they feel like they're choking all the time. Just the thought of wearing like a turtleneck sweater just drives them crazy. And the reason I bring up this sea salt and this Himalayan rock salt is because in Nepal, which is in the Himalayans, uh, for many, many years they had real goiter issues and people in Nepal had really bad hypothyroidism. There was a lot of cretinism, stunted growth, mental retardation, and it was so bad with the goiters that in Nepal, they actually had a different way of looking at beauty. And they decided that the beautiful women were the ones with the biggest goiters. And you have women with huge goiters. I mean, we're talking gigantic goiters. And they were considered the most beautiful ones. Now, why in Nepal, in the Himalayas, were goiters so prevalent? Well, we get iodine from our soil. And when the plant sucks the iodine up, we eat the plant, or the animal eats the plant, and then we eat the animal, we get iodine. Well, there's little to no iodine in the soil in the Himalayans. So if you eat Himalayan rock salt on your food nowadays, because it's like the cool thing to do, you're not getting almost any iodine in your diet. That's because in the United States, we have very little iodine in our soil too. So unless you eat iodized salt, which means that our government said that salt that we've been eating for the last 100, 150 years, you add iodine to that salt so we don't have goiter problems. So unless you're pouring regular old salt on your food and not being cool and eating that pink salt or the sea salt, which by the way, sea salt also has no iodine in it, uh, you are much more likely to have a goiter. You're much more likely to now have hypothyroidism. So this is a serious problem. So make sure that you're eating iodized salt. Uh, there may also be a lack of another mineral in your diet, which is called selenium. Now, if you are taking a multivitamin, there's probably selenium in that. We do also get this from the soil, and you typically get this when you eat your green leafy vegetables, but mm, lots of Americans don't like to eat those things, so you probably want to pop that multivitamin and get your selenium, because you need selenium to help your enzymes, which make T3 and T4. There can also be a genetic defect on chromosome number 15. Okay, so do you remember what 15Q25.3 means? So here's that chromosome. And the smaller section is the P arm. The larger section is the Q arm. And we say this is chromosome number 15. And it's 15Q, so the gene is on this arm. And we're going to count down, let's say, 25 genes down. And this is 15, chromosome 15, Q arm, gene number 25. And then lab with the designation of 3, whoever they are. There's also another gene, 15Q26, can also be at fault. So you may have a genetic defect that does not allow the person to make the right enzymes to be able to produce enough T3 and T4. One other problem could be an autoimmune disease. This autoimmune disease is called... Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And this is an autoimmune disease. This means that the person's immune system has gone bonkers. 
Nobody's exactly sure why. It's probably a combination of a few different things. One is stress. Another is not enough vitamin D. There could be also other vitamins and minerals that are lacking in the person's life, but uh, maybe even a virus that they have. There's been some new research that shows that it might be a virus that's causing this problem. But whatever happens, their immune system goes out of whack. And now the immune system starts to make antibodies. One is called a TPO antibody. Another is a TG antibody. And both of these kill the thyroid. Literally, these antibodies destroy the cells of the thyroid. So the person's own immune system is killing their own thyroid. Now, most likely, the biggest reason for this is probably low vitamin D levels. Because we see a correlation between low vitamin D levels and high antibody levels. If we can get the person's vitamin D levels up, we can make their antibody levels go down. You may not get rid of them, but you can make them go much lower and slow down the progression of this disease. All right, so let's see if you get this hypothyroid thing. So what if I tell you that TSH levels, normal TSH levels, are anywhere from 0.3 to 3.0. These are TSH levels. This is a range, okay? Okay. All right. And let's say that I have a person who comes in to the doctor's office and we find that their T3 and their T4 levels are low. And their TSH levels are 15. What can you tell me about this person? Hypo? Her. Why is their TSH level low? Or I'm sorry, it's not high. low, excuse it's me, high. high. Why is their TSH level high? Is it trying to make more? Yes, that's uh, exactly right. Hormone. Because TSH is trying to force the thyroid to make more T3 and T4. So if T3 and T4 levels are down, the body goes, oh crap, that's not good. Let's pump up the TSH and try to get it to make more and more and more thyroid but it's not able to do it. So is their thyroid the issue? Yeah. yeah, there's something wrong with the thyroid. They can't make enough T3 and T4. Okay, what about this? What if I tell you that the person comes in, a different person, and their T3 and T4 levels are low, and their TSH levels are 1.5. Now what? What will you do for them? Because from what I could understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but this first person who came in, you would treat them, right? Yeah. Would you give them, because if their thyroid's going bad, their TSH is high, their T3 and T4 is low, their thyroid's going bad, you'd probably give them thyroid hormones to take and get their T3 and T4 up, get their metabolism back to normal. Because, you know, if you measure their heart rate, it's probably like 40 beats per minute. They're probably freezing cold all the time. Their hair's falling out. Their skin is dry. They're crying. They're depressed. Because, by the way, remember, the brain is part of the body. It has a metabolism that's regulated by T3 and T4. And if the metabolism is down, that means the metabolism of the brain is down. And we officially call that depression. Okay? Depression means low metabolism of the brain. So anybody who has hypothyroid usually has some pretty good depression going on. But if we can give them T3 and T4 hormones, we can raise that metabolism and we raise what's going on in the brain too. Voila, depression gone. Okay? But what about this person? They have low T3 and T4. And what if I tell you they have basically the same symptoms? They have a low heart rate, they're cold all the time, their hair's falling out, they're crying all the time, they just don't feel good. 
They have really bad constipation. They haven't gone to the bathroom in two weeks. Is their thyroid not working at all? I mean, is that... But their TSH is only 1.5. Mm -hmm. So it's not, do it's not even stimulating trying to make more T3 and T4, right? same thing. So watch. This is the normal range of TSH, but in our first patient who came in whose TSH is 15, do you know what their TSH was when they weren't sick before they got hypothyroid? No. No. We don't know what their normal was, but let's pretend. Let's pretend that their normal was on the high side, and let's pretend their normal TSH was 3. Now they are five times higher than what they were before, aren't they? Yeah. Okay? All right, let's go to our second patient. And their TSH is 1.5. Let's pretend that their normal range was 0.3 before they got sick. Are they not now five times higher than what they were before? See the problem? Because what most doctors will do is they won't treat this patient. They will leave this patient go probably for the next 10 or 15 years miserable in their life because they treat a range. And the problem is nobody knows what their normal range was before they got sick because who takes all these measurements before you get sick? You only take them after. But our two patients have identical symptoms. And by the way, the first patient doesn't have high antibody levels. That only means that our first patient has hypothyroid, but it's not because of an autoimmune disease. Maybe it's genetics or something completely different. Our second patient does have high antibody levels, which tells you right there that that person's immune system is killing their thyroid. And there are very few doctors who will treat this issue. Because you've got to be careful thinking about, oh, well, it's within the range, therefore the person should be okay. But if the person is telling you these are all the symptoms I have. Maybe you should be listening to your patient and not necessarily a range. Before we had any ranges or blood work, a doctor would treat this person. 
now we have ranges and blood work, and now we say go home. And How do we know with the second patient that the antibodies are increased for sure again? How do we know? We took a blood test. We did test the antibodies. Okay, mm -hmm. you said that. Okay. Yep, take a blood test. So you're saying he knew that the antibodies were increased? Mm -hmm. the and okay. still won't okay. treat. My, my response to that is kind of mm -hmm. By the way, one of the major mechanisms that controls the thyroid is the temperature outside. So when it gets colder outside or inside, whatever it may be, it actually is a major stimulator of the hypothalamus. So for instance, in the colder months, you should be making more TRH which means you'll make more TSH, more T3, T4, which warms your body up. That makes sense. In the hotter months, you don't need that much warmth, so you make less TRH, TSH, T3, T4. Now, hyperthyroid is where we're making too much, or I shouldn't say making, we're stimulating the... Um, thyroid hormone too much so that T4 <coughs> secretion goes up. Now, hyperthyroid is also an autoimmune disease. And in hyperthyroid, this is kind of interesting, we make an antibody which is fooling the thyroid into thinking that it's TSH. So this is a TSH-like antibody. It can actually bind directly to the thyroid gland and cause us to make more T3 and T4. And of course, there's all kinds of symptoms for Graves' disease or hyperthyroid, but just think about metabolism speeding up and going too fast. High heart rate, lots of tremors, the person's typically very hyper, their thoughts are hyper. Um, my daughter has a friend who had very, very severe hyperthyroidism and had to have her thyroid basically killed by, remember we talked about the radioactive treatment of the thyroid. However, prior to that, she was fired from a job because they thought she was a speeder. So if you've had any interactions with people who, you know, take methamphetamine, you kind of know the weird thought processes and the way that they interact and react to things. And it's very similar to people who have very serious Graves' disease. Now, don't feel too sorry for her because she did try to tell them, look, I'm not taking drugs. I do have this disease. They fired her anyway. Now she's living very nicely after the lawsuit. So <laughs> I don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, this is just showing you another goiter. Now, here's the weird thing. You can get a goiter from hypothyroid, but you can also get one from hyperthyroid. Because now the thyroid is making too much of everything because it's hyper, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Another very interesting thing that happens with hyperthyroid is that the eyes actually start to protrude. And that is a sure sign of hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease. Now, does that happen? Um, early, early, okay. early, early. Okay. Matter of fact, it could be one of the first symptoms that a person has. Okay. Now, not everybody gets this, but a lot of people who get Graves disease will have the protruding eyes. And unfortunately, once they protrude like that, they don't go back. And nobody's exactly sure what makes them protrude. Some people used to think that water built up behind the eyes and kind of forced it out. Um, maybe there's pressure that builds up behind the eyes and forces it out. Um, but they're not 100% sure about any of it. Okay, now there's hormones also that are going to be associated with the thyroid, but these hormones actually control calcium levels. And one of those hormones that are secreted by the thyroid is calcitonin. Okay? Now, calcitonin coming from the thyroid gland is going to affect calcium levels in the blood and in the bones. The other hormone that's very important in affecting calcium levels is parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid comes from the parathyroid glands which sit behind the thyroid.
So when uh, doctors used to remove the thyroid gland completely out of somebody's body when they had hyperthyroid, um, the person would end up dying within a few weeks because they didn't realize that the parathyroid glands sat directly behind the thyroid and were attached to the thyroid. Now if they have to remove the thyroid gland, let's say for cancer or whatever it may be, they'll really gently remove those parathyroid glands off of the thyroid and they usually implant them in the neck so that they're still able to produce the parathyroid hormone. Can 
and the calcium still can't leave my gut and get into the bloodstream because I can't get the gates open because I don't have enough estrogen. Osteoporosis. And absolutely. So now, because even though I'm eating calcium, even though I have plenty of vitamin D, I don't have enough estrogen, my calcium levels in my blood are low. So I'm stimulating a lot of parathyroid hormone, and I'm breaking down bone to get calcium into my blood. And as I keep breaking down bone year after year, my bone is getting thinner and thinner. And that's right, I have osteoporosis. Now, men and women both get osteoporosis as they age. The difference is that men start out with thicker bones. Okay? Women start out with thinner bones. Now, the reason that men's bones are thicker is because muscle attached to bone is what makes bone thick. So, if I'm picking up something heavy, my muscle is now causing my bone to move and my bone is feeling stress. This is an anti-gravity exercise. I'm lifting it against gravity. This picking something heavy up, okay, causes my bones to be pulled by my muscle, which actually stimulates calcium to be put into my bone. So the fact that men typically have larger muscle and can pick up heavier things than women and do it pretty regularly, means that they stimulate more bone growth and more calcium put into the bone so the bone is thicker, stronger, harder than typically women. So because men have the bigger muscle, the bigger bone, when they go through osteoporosis, it isn't as big of a deal. Unless, of course, they live to be like 110, and then, okay, maybe that will be a big deal. Ladies, if you don't want to end up at 70 years old with super thin bones already, and then start to go through osteoporosis, lift weights. And gentlemen, make your daughters take out the trash too. Make them pick up heavy things. And if they complain, just tell them, it's because I love you, honey, and I don't want you to have osteoporosis. <laughs> okay? Make them build up strong muscles because it really does help to put more calcium in the bone. Now, if I can get the calcium into my bloodstream, if everything is nice and healthy and my calcium levels in the bloodstream go up, this is what stimulates calcitonin. calcium absorption from the gut into the bloodstream. So that, fingers crossed, osteoporosis might not be a problem for you in the future. The first anti-osteoporosis medication they came up with, it was pretty harsh. You drank it as a liquid, and then you had to drink a gallon of water immediately afterwards, or it would burn a hole in your esophagus. So most women were like, eh, no, don't, don't think I'm going to use that stuff. But they started to really improve the anti-osteoporosis medicine, and uh, it looks like it's working fairly well. Any questions about parathyroid or calcium or calcitonin? All right, now let's talk about growth hormone.
the short or the long neurons? Short. short. Absolutely. And then the anterior pituitary releases growth hormone. And then we grow. Now, this is growth at the cellular level. And this is growth of the whole organism. So that means it helps you to grow tall. It also helps individual cells to grow. It's increasing the overall health of the organism. Now, sometimes we'll see a pituitary problem, and usually this is due to a pituitary tumor, where the individual starts to make too much growth hormone. Uh, this happens to be a skeleton that uh, the individual is over 10 feet tall. And this person has a problem called gigantism. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to anatomy. You remember those epiphyseal plates? Mm -hmm. That's the growth plate at the end of your long bones. And those epiphyseal plates are stimulated throughout life before the age of 25 to make your long bones grow in length. Mm -hmm. And the stimulation of those cells are due to growth hormone. And growth hormone is telling you how tall you're going to get. So in this individual, they had a pituitary tumor, and they made too much growth hormone. And this was before the epiphyseal plates fused. So they were able to grow and grow and grow in length of all of their long bones, which means they got taller and taller until they were 10 feet tall. Now, growth hormone doesn't only affect the bones. It also affects the joints. It also affects the internal organs. So that a person with this problem of gigantism is also going to have gigantic organs as well. Typically, these individuals are not tall and happy and healthy. They're usually tall and extremely sickly. Because our heart, our liver, our internal organs were only meant to get a certain genetic size, and theirs got too big. And so they don't function appropriately. So they have all kinds of tremendous disease states. So they'll have cardiovascular issues. They'll have issues with their intestines. They may even have neurological issues. Uh, but they typically also do not live long. Most of your people with gigantism will live maybe into their 30s. And then they succumb to this disease. There is another disease of excess growth hormone called acromegaly. But acromegaly affects you later in life after your epiphyseal plates have fused. So basically after about the age of 25. And so someone will typically develop a pituitary tumor later in life. They're now secreting too much growth hormone. And their bones can get longer, but they can get wider. They can get thicker. So that what you see with these people is they usually have like a protruding forehead, almost like Neanderthal type of thing. Uh, their bones in their skull get thicker. Their fingers become very thick. Uh, their bones can become so thick and heavy, it's hard for them to move because everything is so big and thick. One of the biggest issues is the skull bone. Because what's happening with the skull is, you know, usually our skull is maybe about a quarter of an inch thick. But theirs is thickening. And it can be a half inch or more in thickness. And now what it's doing is it's compressing on the brain. And now you have a person who has some serious issues because of that brain compression going on. Of course, getting that tumor out as quickly as possible is what needs to happen so that they don't keep making that growth hormone. So for that way, it doesn't ever grow outward. It always just continuously grows in. Well, it'll grow outward also. You can see it. You can really see the difference. Now, a decrease in growth hormone, somebody who doesn't make enough, is what we would call dwarfism. This is a person that is fully formed. However, everything is smaller than it should be. Now, we don't really see that very often in the United States anymore because scientists have figured out what the chemical structure of growth hormone is, and they're able to synthesize it in the laboratory. 
so that if you have a child that isn't growing appropriately and the doctors are able to ascertain that it's a growth hormone issue, you can now give that child shots of growth hormone and they will grow to their genetic appropriate size. I had a student a few years ago who brought his mom and dad in to see me to say hi uh, and they were both uh, dwarfs, they were under three feet tall, but he was six foot two. And that's because they knew this was a genetic defect that ran in their family. They did not want him to have the issues of dwarfism. And so they were able to get him growth hormone shots at a young age, and he was able to grow to his appropriate height. Now, it is a genetic defect, which then means his child will carry this on. So the likelihood is that his child would have to have growth hormone shots as well to make sure that the child got to their appropriate size. But this is a pretty easy one, if you catch it early enough in life, pretty easy one to fix. Any other questions? So we've talked about the adrenal gland already. And you know that it has a cortex and a medulla. <clears throat> sits above the kidneys. And the adrenal cortex itself secretes a lot of different hormones. So in that video that we watched, you know that he used the term glucocorticoid. And glucocorticoid is a term basically for cortisol, okay? But we'll also talk about when we get to the kidneys, uh, some, a hormone called a mineral corticoid. This is aldosterone. And this helps to regulate our sodium and potassium levels in the body. When we get to the reproductive system, we're going to talk about androgens, and androgens are a group of hormones uh, like testosterone. Uh, estrogens are also a group of hormones like estradiol, estriol, and then progesterones or progesti progestogens. Uh, we'll talk about each of these, androgens, estrogens, progesterones, uh, when we get to the reproductive system, but I just wanted you to know that these are all secreted by the adrenal cortex. Now the adrenal cortex, if you look at the adrenal cortex, it has three major zones or three major areas to it. Towards the surface of the adrenal gland is what we call the zona glomerulosa. And then a little bit deeper is the zona reticularis, or excuse me, the zona fasciculata. And then a little bit deeper than that is the zona reticularis, and then you have the adrenal medulla. So going from the outer surface, the zona glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis, and then the adrenal medulla. Now, this shows you the glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis, and then the adrenal medulla. Now we know the adrenal medulla releases the catecholamines, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. The glomerulosa releases mineral corticoids. The fasciculata releases glucocorticoids, and the reticularis releases the sex hormones like estrogens and androgens. So I want you to know which zone releases what. The mineral corticoids are regulating minerals, which are the salts of our body. The glucocorticoids are regulating cortisol, which also regulates the sugar of our body. And then the sex hormones. So you might be able to remember it like this. This is salty, sweet sex. <laughs> Okay, that might help you to remember. So glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis, salty, sweet sex. Uh, a couple of diseases I want you to know about. One is called Addison's disease. And Addison's disease is where there is a deficiency of hormones from the adrenal cortex, in particular aldosterone. So this is part of the adrenal cortex has been destroyed, usually from some kind of an accident. So for instance, uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, you might have heard of him, uh, he had Addison's disease. And uh, he got it because he fell off a horse, and when he fell off the horse, he actually hit a rock, and the rock was right where his adrenal gland was located, and it destroyed part of his adrenal gland, and he couldn't make enough aldosterone. And one of the interesting things about Addison's disease is it also affects the color of your skin. So for Kennedy, who was actually a white Irish boy, 
it made him, his skin take on sort of this bronze looking color and everybody thought that that meant that he was this healthy, athletic, outdoor, tan guy. But if you look at the rest of his family, they're all white Irish people. And uh, white Irish people don't tan, but John Kennedy did. And so because people thought he was so healthy, they really used that as a major reason for voting him into the presidency. But Kennedy was actually extremely sickly and couldn't go anywhere without his doctor as part of his entourage because he had to be given shots of aldosterone multiple times a day because if he didn't have enough aldosterone, he couldn't control the sodium and potassium levels in his body and he could die at any moment. And no one knew anything about it until years after he had been assassinated. Another disease I want you to be aware of is something called Cushing's disease, sometimes also called Cushing's syndrome. And this is where there is a problem with the adrenal glands and the person produces too much cortisol. Now one of the interesting things about Cushing's syndrome is that cortisol, if you remember in the video we watched, they said cortisol makes you fat. And remember she said the interesting thing in her lab was that she noticed that cortisol also told the body where fat is delivered, where it goes. And so if you have excessive amounts of cortisol, one of the things you'll see is the person gets a lot of fat in their face and they get kind of this moon-shaped face. They also will get a lot of fat in between their shoulder blades and get what we would call a buffalo hump. And then cortisol also takes all of the fat out of the arms, out of the legs, and gives the person this big pear-shaped abdominal region. And the individual will gain lots and lots of weight. So they'll have these really skinny arms and legs, but a lot of fat in the abdomen, fat between the shoulder blades. And one of the things that they'll say is, I hardly eat at all. I don't know how I'm becoming so fat. This can be caused by stress then too, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, stress can do a very similar thing to the person. Now typically this is due to injury to the adrenal gland or also could be a tumor of the adrenal gland. And cortisol also helps to control emotion in the brain. So you could also have a person who has big mood, mood swings. Huge. One minute they're super duper happy, the next minute they're having a serious crying time. And that's something different than bipolar disorder. Oh yes, because bipolar, one of the things about bipolar that most people don't realize is a person with bipolar disorder does not change mood like that. Okay? As a matter of fact, somebody with bipolar disorder, they could be happy for five years. And then all of a sudden, they become very, very sad. And now they're sad for five years. So it's not an on-off, one minute they're happy, the next minute they're sad. It usually does not occur like that. Uh, but somebody with Cushing's disease, it does. One minute they could be the happiest person in the world, and the next minute they're crazy depressed. Or even crazy angry. So you have all these emotional jumbles that are happening constantly, and the person says, I don't know what's wrong with me, I feel like I'm going crazy, I can't control my emotions. And that's because literally they can't. Their cortisol is off the charts, way too high. Now you can see this is the same person who has developed Cushing's disease over the years. So you can see how it's changed the structure of her hair, the structure of her face because she's added a lot of extra fat to the face, uh, the hump that she's getting between the shoulders, slouching, actually kind of lost inches on her body. Doesn't even look like the same person, but it is after a couple of years of Cushing's disease. It has nothing to do with whether she has good posture or not. Okay? It's from the disease. What do they do to lower the cortisol levels? Uh, usually they're going to actually kill off part of the adrenal gland. Okay, so let's talk about glucose regulation and then we're done with the endocrine system for today. <coughs> You know the pancreas is involved in this, mm -hmm. and the pancreas is going to release a couple important hormones, and one we've already talked about, which was insulin. Another one that I want to talk about is glucagon. 
Uh, but we'll also talk about the pancreas when we get into the gastrointestinal system because another job of the pancreas is it's a big exocrine gland. It releases a whole bunch of digestive enzymes that help us to uh, digest our food. So the pancreas has what are called the islets of Langerhans. These are groups of cells that are made out of alpha, beta, and delta cells. Alpha cells secrete the hormone called glucagon, beta cells secrete insulin, and delta cells secrete something called somatostatin. Now we're not going to get into somatostatin as much, but we are going to talk about glucagon and insulin because they kind of work together in the body. So we know that there's a disease that happens due to these islet of Langerhans cells burning out, specifically the beta cells, and this disease is diabetes. And there are a couple different types of diabetes. There's a diabetes mellitus and a diabetes insipidus. Uh, we'll talk more about diabetes insipidus when we get into the renal system because it really comes into play in the renal system. But diabetes mellitus is all about the kind of diabetes you think of when you think of somebody who has diabetes, okay? They have issues regulating their insulin. They have issues regulating their sugar. Now, we have a diabetes type 1 and a diabetes type 2 that we're all very aware of, uh, but the World Health Organization is now saying that they believe there's a type 3, 4, and 5, which is really kind of interesting. And the 3, 4, and 5 are all environmental issues. Type 3 diabetes is actually Alzheimer's disease. Interesting that sugar levels and the regulation of sugar levels and having sugar levels that are too high seem to be causing brain damage. And so there's a direct correlation between sh blood sugar levels and damage to the brain. And this is also one of the reasons why it's believed that we're seeing younger and younger people with Alzheimer's. So we're now calling Alzheimer's diabetes type 3. Now type 1 is where the person is making either no insulin or very little insulin. And type 2 is where the cells are not responding to insulin because of downregulation. So insulin is a protein hormone and it's supposed to bind to receptors on the outside of the cell. However, those receptors have downregulated. And that's because there's too much sugar in the blood all the time which leads to too much insulin in the blood all the time. And anytime we have too much going on with the receptors, the cell downregulates those receptors. So now we may have high sugar levels, high insulin levels, but the cells don't respond to the insulin. Used to be that we didn't see type 2 in children, but we are seeing it more and more nowadays in children. And it's really because of what we're feeding our kids. That's the down regulation. Mm -hmm. kids. Usually if you saw diabetic problems in children, it was because they were born with pancreatic problems, things like that, and so they would have type 2. And so we used to call type, or excuse me, type 1, we used to call that juvenile diabetes, and type 2 we call adult onset diabetes. You said 4 and 5 are environmental? Yes. So we know that glucose is converted to glycogen, stored in the liver and the skeletal muscles. We use glucose for ATP production, okay? And when glucose levels are high, we're supposed to release insulin, and then insulin causes our cells to uptake the glucose, okay? So insulin also helps to trap that glucose in the cell and in the liver causes initiation of glycogen production, which of course makes perfect sense. Now one of the other things that's very interesting, maybe about five or six years ago, a scientist was looking at glucose levels, insulin levels, and came across an interesting correlation between glucose levels and hemoglobin. Now, 
our hemoglobin, okay, if you remember we talked about this, hemoglobin is a quaternary structure. It's made up of four proteins, okay? And each one of these proteins is referred to as a globin. And in the middle of these proteins is an iron-containing compound that attaches to these proteins, and this iron-containing compound is the heme portion of this molecule. Okay? So we put the two together, we have hemoglobin. Now, what the scientists noticed was, depending on the amount of carbohydrates a person ate, which of course correlated with how much sugar was in their blood, it actually changed the shape of the hemoglobin molecules. So that the globin protein took on a bit of a different shape. And he, the scientist, referred to the change in shape. He said this is what he would call hemoglobin A1C. So he was able to come up with a handy dandy little chart. And he found that the correlation of the percentage of hemoglobin A1C in a person's blood told you the amount of sugar that they had had over their blood on average for the last three months. So that, you know, we should have somewhere around 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is 100 milliliters of blood, which then says that our hemoglobin A1C level should be below 6. Probably somewhere around 5.7 is around 100 milligrams per deciliter. If you have a hemoglobin A1C that hit 6, you now have an average blood sugar level for the last three months that's been too high, and you need to get your crap together. If you have a hemoglobin A1C that's 12, holy cow, this is bad. Because, of course, we know that these sugars in the blood start to cause destruction of things and lead to diseases. So this is a really nice chart for doctors to be able to look at because it's better than I just draw your blood today and I see what your glucose levels are today. Now I get a picture of what your glucose levels were for the last three months. That's really quite nice. Yeah, and then I can say, okay, I need you to watch your sugar levels and come back in three months and we'll see what happens over the next three months. Or let's say you have a hemoglobin of 5.9. So you're getting close, not quite but you're getting close. I'm going to probably give you a medicine called metformin. Because that's pre-diabetic, right? About 5.7? 5.7 is not, but 5.9 is. And we don't call it pre-diabetic anymore. What disease do we call this? Metabolic, Metabolic syndrome. syndrome. Which just basically for us means down-regulation of insulin receptors. That's what that means. Now metformin, also known as glucophage, what it does is it actually prevents the liver from releasing glycogen. Now, why is that good for somebody who has an A1C of 6? Why do we not want the liver to release glycogen? Perfect. Because glycogen is nothing but a bunch of glucose molecules all hooked together, right? So if I can keep all that glycogen in the liver, I won't get as many glucose molecules in the bloodstream and then I can decrease the damage that all that excess glucose might do in my bloodstream. So the metformin prevents all that glucose from leaving the liver. And you get this at what? what levels? Usually somewhere around 5.9. And then we probably will continue to give it to them in the sixes. If they get a little higher than six, they may start going on some other medications and maybe taking like oral insulin but you really want your patients to be below 6. That's what you're shooting for. And below 5.7, that would be beautiful. So we're not really as much concerned about this uh, just plain old sugar levels anymore. We're more concerned about the hemoglobin A1C levels. And how do they connect the percentage to the Lots and sugar? lots of research on taking people's A1C and seeing what their glucose levels were. And what's the percentage mean? Like 6% of what? 6% okay, of the hemoglobin in your body is an A1C shape. 
So remember, when sugar attaches to hemoglobin, it causes it to change shape. So now I've changed 6% of my hemoglobin to take on that A1C shape. Does, does changing it affect um, the amount of iron in? No, but it does affect it does affect oxygen uptake. Okay, so it doesn't have the same affinity to the oxygen. No, that's correct. The other hormone I'm going to talk about is glucagon. So when glucose levels in the blood go up, insulin levels go up. But when glucose levels in the blood go down, glucagon is activated. So if I have low glucose levels in the blood, I'm going to make more glucagon. So maybe I'm fasting. And because I'm fasting, I now have a decrease in glucose in the blood. Which will stimulate my pancreas to make more glucagon. Now, what I need is I need to increase those glucose levels so I can make lots of ATP. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to go through what's called gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. What's gluconeogenesis? Perfect. Proteins and fat get converted to carbs so that I can make ATP. Glycogenolysis, what's that? Okay, take glycogen, break it up, get a bunch of glucose. And so the glucose levels in my blood can go up, I can make the ATP that's necessary in my body. 